My stream just my stream just got taken down. We're giving up on that. My stream was just taken down. I don't don't even know why. I, that's not. I don't like it when my stream down for absolutely no reason. I don't even know what happened. I need to make the new thumbnail for this video. Oh my god. I know what I do. Oh, I can't put the thumbnail in either. What's wrong with this thing, bro? Oh my goodness. I don't even know what's happening. Okay. We're going to start reading this thing because we're just going to get right down to it. We lost all our views, too. I, I don't understand why YouTube just took down the stream. I don't understand. Okay. Live. Oh, I can change the thumbnail. That's pretty epic. Um, let me change the thumbnail, and then we're going to get right into reading this. We're not going to stop unless YouTube takes down our stream again, which I really would like. YouTube, I really wouldn't like that. But we're, we're getting this. We're getting this done. We're doing it. We're getting this thing done. Hopefully you can still see me, because I am in a different tab than the live streaming tab. Um, okay. Thumbnail. I should have already done that, but oh well. Thumbnail is in. All right. We're good. Quarantine did hit me hard. Okay, we're starting. If you want to check, we're on Human History Wiki. We're not stopping until we finish this. And we have so much less viewers than we had. Because that's just great, isn't it? Ready? Ready, set, go. Human history. Human history, or the history of humanity, or the history of the world, is the carefully researched description of humanity's past. It is carefully researched on description of humanity's past. It is informed by archaeology, anthropology, genetics, linguistics, and other disciplines. And for periods since the invention of writing, by recorded history, and by secondary sources and studies. I think I've made a mistake by putting myself through this. Humanity's written history was preceded by its prehistory, beginning with the patho paleologic paleothic era, the old stone age, followed by the Neolithic era, the new stone age. The Neolithic saw the arc agriculture revolution begin between 8,000 and 5,000 BC. Ah, oh, he, he bounced, he left. In the Near East's Fertile Crescent, during this period, humans began the systematic husbandry of plants and animals. As agriculture, as agriculture advanced, most humans transitioned from nomadic to a settled lifestyle as farmers in permanent settlements. The relative security and increased productivity provided by farming allowed communities to expand into increasingly larger units, fostered by advances in transportation. This is so exciting. Wow. Why is my lighting bad, though? Why are you going to be like that? I like this good uh, temporary setup, though. Uh, you going to work? Okay, back to the grind. If we can have one viewer on this the entire time. Um, whether in prehistoric or historic times, people always needed to be near reliable sources of portable water. Settlements developed on river banks as early as 3000 BC in Mesopotamia, on the banks of Egypt's Nile River. 
in the Indus River Valley and along China's rivers. As, as farming developed, grain agriculture became more sophisticated and prompted a division of labor to store food between growing sessions, seasons. <sighs> labor divisions led to the rise of leisured upper class and the development of cities, which provided the foundation for civilization. The growing complexity of human societies necessitated, uh, necessitated systems of accounting and writing. We're three paragraphs in and like a hundred million paragraph wiki page. <sighs> And get through this. We had like six viewers, but I guess that left. With civilizations flourishing, ancient history, anti antiquity, um, including the classical age up to about 500 uh, common era, saw the rise and fall of empires. Post classical history, the Middle Ages, 500 to 1500 common era, witnessed the rise of Christianity. The Islamic Golden Age, 750 to 1258, and the early Italian Renaissance, from about from around 1300, the mid 15th century introduction of movable movable type printing in Europe, revolutionized communication and, faci and facilitated even ever wider dissemination of information, hastening the end of the Middle Ages and ushering in the scientific revolution. The early modern period, sometimes referred to as the European Age and era of the Islamic gunpowder empires, from about 1500 to 1800, included the Age of Enlightenment and the Age of Exploration. By the 18th century, the, accum the accumulation of knowledge and technology had reached a critical mass that brought about the Industrial Revolution and began the late modern period which started around 1800 and has continued through the present. Okay, so we're four paragraphs in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, about uh, 60 there, 70, 80, 90, and that's about the end. These are really long paragraphs, though. Okay, so there's about 100 paragraphs, but they're longer than this one, so we're not even close to done. This scheme of historical periodiz periodization, yeah, it's a lot. We'll be here for hours. Dividing history into antiquity, post-classical, early modern, and late modern periods was developed for and applies best to the history of the old world, particularly Europe and the Mediterranean. Outside this region, including ancient China and ancient India, historical timelines unfolded differently. However, by the 18th century, due to extensive world trade and colonization, the histories of most civilizations had become substantially intertwined a process known as globalization. In the last quarter millennium, the rates of growth of population, knowledge, technology, communications, commerce, weapons, destructiveness, and environmental degradation have greatly accelerated, creating opportunities and perils that now confront the planet's human com communities. Okay, that's the intro. We're into prehistory. I'm saying there's a hundred paragraphs. I don't know if it's gonna be over or under, and I'm gonna say we're gonna be done in three hours. Prehistory. Early humans. Genetic measurements indicate that the ape lineage, which would lead to Homo sapiens, diverged in a lineage that would lead to chimpanzees and bonobos. The closest, closest living relatives of modern humans, around 4.6 to 6.2 million years ago. Anatomically, modern humans arose in Africa about 300,000 years ago, 
and reached behavioral modernity about 50,000 years ago. Modern humans, three hours, yeah. Modern humans spread rapidly from Africa into the frost-free zones of Europe and Asia around 60,000 years ago. The rapid, rapid expansion of humankind to North America and Oceania took place at the climax of the most recent Ice Age, when temperate regions of the day were extremely inhospitable. Yet, humans had colonized nearly all the ice-free parts of the globe by the end of the Ice Age, some 12,000 years ago. Other hominids, such as Homo erectus, had been using simple wood and stone tools for millennia, but as time passed, tools became far more refined and complex. Next paragraph. This is paragraph 7. 6. Perhaps as early as 1.8 million... No, it's 7. Perhaps as early as 1.8 million years ago, but certainly 500,000 years ago, humans began using fire for heat and cooking. They also developed language in the Paleothic period, and a conceptual repertoire that included systematic burial of the dead and the adornment of the living. Early artistic expression can be found in the form of cave paintings and sculptures made from ivory, stone, bone, and showing spirituality, spirituality, generally interpreted as animism or even shamanism. During this period, all humans lived as hunter-gatherers and were generally nomadic. Uh, archaeological, archaeological, my spelling is just going to get worse and worse as I have less uh, stuff in my mouth. Uh, I don't know why I said stuff in my mouth. Like less, I, I don't know, saliva? Um, whew. The genetic data suggests that the source population of Paleothic hunter-gatherers survived in sparsely wooded areas. Hey, Alan, you didn't bring a package in yesterday, did you? Nope. Hunter-gatherers survived in sparsely wooded areas and dispersed through areas in high primary productivity while avoiding death's forest cover. We're going to ignore that. Uh, thing that just happened of me saying no to an unknown person. All right. Next part, rise of civilization. The Neolithic Revolution, beginning around 10,000 BCE, saw the development of agriculture, which fundamentally changed the human lifestyle. Farming developed around 10,000 BCE in the Middle East, around 7,000 BCE in what is now China, around 6,000 BC in the Indus Valley and Europe, and around 4,000 BC in the Americas. Cultivation of cereal crops, crops and the domestication of animals occurred about 8,500 BC in the Middle East, where wheat and barley were the first crops of sheep and, goat, sheep and goats were domesticated. In the Indus Valley, Crops were cultivated by 6,000 BC, along with domesticated cattle. Yellow River Valley in China cultivated millet and other cereal crops around 7,000 BC, but the Yangtze Valley domesticated rice earlier, by at least 8,000 BC. Um, in the Americas, sunflowers were cultivated by about 4,000 BC, and maize and beans were domesticated in Central America by 3,500 BC. Um, Potatoes were first cultivated in the Andes Mountains of South America, where the llama was also domesticated. Metalworking, uh, starting with copper around 6000 BC, was first used for tools and ornaments. Gold soon followed, with its main use for being, being for ornaments. The need for metal ores stimulated trade, as many of the areas of early settlement were lacking in ores, bronze, and an alloy of copper and tin was first known from about 2500 BC, but did not become widely used until much later. That was a long paragraph. Next paragraph. Put myself up in this one. Through early proto cities um, appeared through appeared at Jer Jericho and Kettlehyuk. Around 6,000 BC, the first civilization did not emerge until around 3,000 BC, 
in Egypt and Mesopotamia. These cultures gave birth to the invention of the wheel, mathematics, bronze working, sailing boats, the pottery wheel, woven cloth, the construction of monumental buildings, and writing. Writing developed independently and at different times in five areas of the world, Egypt, India, Mesopotamia, China, and Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica, I think. Uh, that was a short paragraph. I don't know what I was doing there. <clears throat> We're doing this. Farming permitted far denser populations, in which, which in time organized into states. Agriculture also created food surpluses that could support people not directly engaged in food production. The development of agriculture permitted the creation of the first cities. These were the centers of trade, manufacturing, and political power. Cities established a symbiosis um, with their surrounding countrysides, absorbing agriculture products and, and providing, in return, manufactured goods in varying degrees of military control and protection. <clears throat> the development of cities was synonymous with the rise of civilization. Yeah, we got a long way to go. Um, we're not even in ancient history. We're still in prehistory. I lost it. Um, Egyptian civilization along the Nile River, the Harappan civilization in the Indus River Valley, present-day India and Pakistan, the Chinese civilization along the Yellow and Yangtze Rivers. These societies developed a number of unifying characteristics, including a central government, a complex economy and social structure, sophisticated language and writing systems, and distinct cultures and religions. Writing facilitated the administration of cities, the expression of ideas, and the preservation of information. That's another paragraph, a very long paragraph. I believe that's the 10th paragraph. Entities such as the sun, moon, earth, sky, and sea were often deity, deified. Shrines developed, which evolved into temple establishments complete with a complex hierarchy of priests and priestesses and other functionaries. Typical of the Neolithic was a tendency to worship anthropomorphic deities. Among the earliest surviving written religious scriptures were, are the Egyptian pyramid texts, the oldest of which the date is between 2400 and 2300 BC. BC. Okay, we are in Ancient history. That was all prehistory. This is like, it's the real stuff. This is where it is. This is like 4,500 years, 4,000, 5,000 years ago. We're doing this. Okay. Ancient history. The cradles of civilization. Okay, this is the Bronze Age into the Bronze Age, boys. And we're still probably maybe like a 20th through. The Bronze Age is a part of the three-age system, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, that for some parts of the world describes effectively the early history of civilization. During this era, the most fertile areas of the world saw city-states in the first civilizations develop. These were concentrated in the fertile river valleys, the, tig the Tigris and the Euphrates. Oh, I should know that. I, I should know how to pronounce it. In, the in Mesopotamia. The Nao in Egypt, the Indus in the Indian subcontinent, and the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers in China. Summer, Sumer, located in Mesopotamia, is the first known complex civilization, developing the first city-states in the 4th millennium BCE. It was in these cities that the earliest form of writing, cuneiform script, appeared around 3000 BC. Cuneiform writing began as a system of pictographs. God, I'm already done. Um, the, these pictorial representations eventually became simplified and more abstract. Cuneiform texts were often written on clay tablets, which symbols were drawn with a, red, bl with a blunt reed used as a stylus. Writing made the administration of a larger state far easier. Transport was facilitated by waterways, by rivers and seas. The Mediterranean Sea 
at the juncture of three continents, fostered the projection of military power and the change of goods, ideas, and inventions. This era also saw new land technologies, such as horse-based cavalry and chariots, which allowed armies to move faster. <sighs> you know, I should really drink water. I'm, I'm, my mouth is so dry. Um, but I don't have any water to drink. I was just... I got one drop of water. It's enough. All right, that was the 12th. 13th paragraph. Transport was facilitated by waterways, by rivers and seas. The Mediterranean Sea, at the juncture of three continents, fostered the projection of military power and the exchange of goods, ideas, and inventions. This era also saw new land technologies such as horse-based cavalry and chariots. That led the iron design. I read that. Um, these developments led to the rise of territorial states and empires. In Mesopotamia, there was there prevailed a pattern of independent warring city states and a and of a loose shifting from one city to another. In Egypt, by conquer, by contrast, Lower Egypt was shortly followed by unification of, of all the valley around 3100 BCE, followed by permanent pacification. In Crete, the Minoan civilization had entered the Bronze Age by 2700 BC and is regarded as the first civilization in Europe. Over the next millennia, other river valleys saw monarchical, monarchical empires rose the, rise to power. In the 25th, 21st centuries BC, the empires of Akkad and Sumer arose in Mesopotamia. 13th paragraph. Number 14. Over the following millennia, civilizations developed across the world. Trade increasingly became a source of power, and states with access to important resources or controlling important trade routes rose to dominance. By 1400 BC, Mycenaean Greece began to develop. In India, this era was known as the Vedic period, which laid the foundation of Hinduism and other cultural aspects of early Indian society, and ended in the 6th century BC. From around 550 BC, independent kingdoms and known as were established across the continent. Quite some nice, happy Easter! Happy Easter to you, my guy. Wait, Mahajanapadas. Oh, I knew that. I just yeah. Number 14. As complex civilization rose in the Eastern Hemisphere, the indigenous societies in the Americas remained relatively simple and fragmented into diverse regional cultures. During the form formative stage in Mesoamerica, around 1500 to 500 CE, more complex and centralized civilizations began to develop, mostly in now what is Mexico, Central America, and Peru. They include civilizations such as the Olmec, Maya, Zapotec, Moshe, and Nazca. They developed agriculture, growing maize, chili peppers, cocoa, tomatoes, and potatoes, crops unique to the Americas, and creating distinct cultures and religions. The, these ancient indigenous societies would become greatly affected for good and ill by European contact during the early modern period. Okay, I need to get some water. I need to get some water. I need to move real quick. Okay. Yeah, I got the water. I have gotten the water, and now we're good to go. Put it right there. 
Okay, time for more human history. Oh, yeah. Where were we? Yep. Okay, we're in the Axel Age. The Axel Age. Let's call it. Yeah, the Axel Age. Beginning in the 8th century BC, the Axel Age saw the development of a set of transformative philosophical, philosophical and religious ideas, mostly independently. Yo, what's up? What's up, everybody? Yo. Why am I doing this? I don't know. Actually, I do know. It's because quarantine has brought me here. Um, independently, in many different places, Chinese Confucianism, Indian Buddhism, and Jainism, and Jewish monotheism, all were claimed by some scholars that had developed in the 6th century BC. Carl Jasper's a Axial Age Theory also includes Persian Zoroastrianism, but other scholars, other scholars dispute his timeline for that. All right. In the 5th century BC, Socrates and Plato uh, made substantial advantages advantages in the development of ancient Greek philosophy. In the East, three schools of thought would dominate Chinese thinking well into the 20th century. These were Taoism, Legalism, and Confucianism. It's 407. Mm. Mm. We've already been at this for half an hour, really like 45 minutes, but the other stream got taken down. Um, yeah, we were here. The Confucian tradition, which would become particularly dominant, looked for political majority morality, uh, not to focus, not to the force of law, but to the power and example of tradition. Confucianism would later spread to Korean Peninsula and towards Japan. We're actually making pretty good progress. Um, in the West, the Greek philosophical tradition, represented by Socrates, Pla Plato, and Aristotle, and other philosophers, along with the accumulated science, technology, and culture, diffused throughout Europe, Egypt, the Middle East, and Northwest India, starting in the 4th century BC, after conquests of Alexander III of Macedon, aka Alexander the Great. Regional empires. New section. New section. New drink. Epic. I really need to crack my back. Regional empires. Millennium from 500 BC to 500 C, common era, saw a series of empires of unprecedented size develop. Well trained professional armies, unifying ideologies, and advanced bureaucracies created the possibility for emperors to rule over large domains of whose populations could attain numbers upwards to tens of millions of subjects. The great empires depended on military annexation of territory and the formation of the defended settlements to become agricultural centers. Why did I not turn this light off? Why didn't I do that? Not smart. My hair doesn't look as bad today as it usually does. Okay. The relative peace that the empires brought encouraged international trade, most notably the massive trade routes in the Mediterranean, the maritime trade web in the Indian Ocean, and the Silk Road. In southern Europe, the Greeks and later the Romans, in an era known as classical and antiquity, Established cultures whose practices, laws, and customs are considered the foundation of the contemporary Western culture. Why isn't my phone plugged in? I need my phone to stay alive for this stream to stay alive. All right. There were a number of regional empires during this period. The Kingdom of Medes helped to destroy the Assyrian Empire. <sighs> in tandem with the nomadic Scythians and the Babylonians. Nevea 
and the capital of uh, Syria, was sacked by the Medes in 612 BCE. The Median Empire gave way to the successive Iranian empires, including the Archimedean Empire, 330 BC, the Parthian Empire, 247 to 227, um, the Sassanian Empire, uh, 224 to 651. Um, there we go. I already need this so bad. But at least there's consistent viewers. No one's leaving. And you really should. But. Okay, several empires began in modern day Greece. First was the Delian League, the Delian League, from 447 BC, and the succeeding Athenian Empire. <clears throat> 454 to 404 BC, centered in present-day Greece, later Alexander the Great of Macedon, founded an empire of conquest extending from present-day Greece to present-day India. Go right here. Nice. Um, I lost count again. The empire divided shortly after his death, but after the influence of Hellenistic uh, successors, made for an extended Hellenistic period, three, uh, 323 to 31 BCE, throughout the region. In Asia, the Maurya Empire existed in present-day India in 3rd century BCE. Most of South Asia was united to the Maurya Empire by Mr. Maurya and flourished under Ashoka the Great. From the 3rd century CE, common era, the Gupta dynasty oversaw the period referred to as Ancient India's Golden Age. From the 4th to 6th centuries, northern India was ruled by the Gupta Empire. In southern India, three prominent Dravidian kingdoms emerged, the Cheras, Cholas, and Pandyas. Like, Pandas with a Y. The ensuing stability contributed to heralding the golden age of Hindu culture in the 4th and 5th centuries. Oh, we're still making progress in this? Wait, if I go like this. Yeah, no, we are making a lot of progress in, I think... Yeah, okay. We might be like a fifth through it now. <laughs> Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. In Europe, oh, we're getting to the Roman, okay. In Europe, whew, the Roman Empire, centered in present day Italy, began in the seventh century BC. In the third century BC, the Roman Republic began expanding its territory through conquests and alliances. What? I just, I look away for one second and I've lost everything. By the time of Augustus, the first Roman Empire, Emperor, Rome had already established uh, dom dominion over most of the Mediterranean. The empire would continue to grow, controlling most, most, much of the land from England to Mesopotamia, reaching its greatest extent over the emperor Trajan, died in 117, in the 3rd century uh, common era. Um, the empire split into western and eastern regions, with usually separate empires. The western empire would fall in 476, to German influence under um, a dark sir, but it's really barbarians, we don't know that. The Eastern Empire, now known as the Byzantine Empire, and its capital in Constantinople, would continue for another thousand years until Constantinople was Constantinople was conquered by the Ottoman Empire in 1453. In China, the Qin Dynasty was the first imperial dynasty of China, it was followed by the Han Empire. The Han Dynasty was compared in power to in, and influence the Roman Empire that lay at the other side of the Silk Road. And these viewers are just like fluctuating, like boop, 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 boop. 
I'll go right here to make better lighting. <sighs> Han China developed advanced cartography, shipbuilding, and navigation. The Chinese invented blast furnaces and created finely tuned copper instruments. As with other empires during the classical period, Han China advanced significantly in the areas of government, education, mathematics, astronomy, technology, and many others. All right. In Africa, the kingdom of Aksum, centered in present day Ethiopia. <sighs> don't yawn, don't yawn. Established itself by the first century CE as a major trading empire, dominating its neighbors in South Arabia and Kush, and controlling the Red Sea trade. So how's quarantine going? And it's not bad. It's actually quarantine. This is what quarantine's brought me to. And I can't believe it. But I'm really not surprised. Surprised I didn't think of this earlier. Yeah, for good. Okay. It minted its own currency and carved enormous monolithic steels such as the obelisk of Axum to mark their emperor's graves. Oh, if you almost missed it. Yeah, you almost missed this too. I mean, no, this is going to go for hours and hours. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, you just remember what's happening. Mm, this is going to be great. Successful regional empires were also established in the Americas, arising from cultures established as early as 2500 BCE in Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica. Vast pre Columbian societies were built, the most notable being the Zapotec Empire and the Maya civilization, which reached its highest state in development during the Mesoamerican Classic period, but continued throughout the post-classic period until the arrival of the Spanish in 16th century CE. Maya, Maya civilization arose Maya civilization What? Uh, it's going to be a theme here. Maya civilization arose as the Omec mother culture gradually declined. Ooh. The great Mayan city-states slowly ro rose in number and prominence, and Maya culture spread throughout the Yucatan and surrounding areas. The later empire of the Aztecs was built on neighboring cultures and was influenced by conquering people such as the Toltecs. Some areas experienced slow but steady technolo technological advances, which important developments such as the stirrup and moldboard plow arriving every few centuries. There were, however, in some regions, periods of rapid technological progress. Most, most important, perhaps, was the Hellenistic period in the region of the Mediterranean, during which hundreds of technologies were invented. Such periods were followed by periods of technological decay, as during the Roman Empire's decline and fall and the ensuing early medieval period. Okay. We're in the next part. We're gonna do something real quick, and I'm gonna get water, and we're gonna we're gonna speed through this whole section. This this might be the longest section. It's gonna be the early medieval period, because we're speeding right past the uh, the ancient history. Prehistory was easy. Okay, we're ready. We're gonna speed right through this era. You may ask what I was doing. I'm just cracking my back. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, let's do it. Declines falls, and resurgence. The, the ancient empires faced common problems associated with maintaining huge armies and supporting a central bureaucracy. These costs fell more, most heavily on the peasantry, 
Well, landowning magnates increasingly evade decentralized control and its cost. Can I? This might be better. It won't. It won't. It just won't be better. I'm always trying to make better lighting. It never works, though. It never works. Okay. Barbarian pressure on the front frontiers has an internal dissolution. China's Han Dynasty fell into civil war in 220, beginning the Three Kingdoms period. I love the Three Kingdoms period. How its Roman counterpart became increasingly decentralized and divided about the same time in what is known as the Crisis of the Third Century. The great empires of Eurasia were all located on temperate and subtropical coastal plains. See, so yeah, I was looking straight at it, and I still lost my direction. Um, okay. Anyway, light lighting isn't real. Abby, Avi, Avi, I don't know. I don't care. I don't care who you are because you're like Sean. Um, okay, mainly the Mongols and Turks dominated a large part of the continent. The development of the stirrup and breeding of horses strong enough to carry a fully armed Archer made the nomads a constant threat to more settled civilizations. A gradual breakup of the Roman Empire, spanning several centuries after the second century common era. It's not like you got anywhere. No, I, I got nowhere to go. I I got I got wiki pages to read. Epic. Not epic. Point to turn the camera. Dumb, dumb guy. I still don't know. I don't even know. I don't even know anymore. Still have seven people watching. Oh well. Um. Okay. The Western Roman Empire fell under the domination of Germanic. I can't stop. <laughs> Germanic tribes in the 5th century, and these po polities gradually developed into a number of warring states, all associated in one way or another with the Catholic Church. The remaining part of the Roman Empire in the Eastern Mediterranean continued on what would be called the Byzantine Empire. Centuries later, a limited unity would be restored in the Western Europe through the establishment in 1692 of a revived Roman Empire later called the Home, Holy Roman Empire, compromising a number of states in what is now Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Czechia, Belgium, Italy, and parts of France. Wikipedia, you gotta, you gotta update your stuff. It's not called Czech Republic anymore. They're Czechia. In China, dynasties would rise and fall, but by sharp contrast, Mediterranean European world, dynastic unity would be restored. After the fall of the Eastern Han Dynasty and the demise of the Three Kingdoms, nomadic tribes from the north began to invade in the 4th century, eventually conquering areas of northern China and setting up many small kingdoms. The Sui Dynasty successfully reunited the whole of China in, 15, eight, in 581 and the laid foundations for a Chinese golden age under the Tang Dynasty. So many dances. Okay, okay, okay. That's that. And now, we're getting the post-classical history. History makes a lot of content for you right there. Post-classical history is basically... The Middle Ages, the Crusades, and I think the Renaissance too. So that's where we're gonna have to 
Never stop reading through. Let's do this thing. Okay. Post classical history. The term post classical era, though derived from the Eurocentric name of the era, classical antiquity, takes place in a broader geographic sweep. The era is commonly dated from the 6th century, the fall of the Western European Roman Empire, which fragmented into many separate kingdoms, some of which would later be confederated under the Holy Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire survived until late in the post-classical or the medieval period. Post-classical period also encompasses the early Muslim conquest, the subsequent Islamic Golden Age, and the commencement and expansion of the Arab slave trade. Oh, great. Um, followed by Mongol invasions of the Middle East, Central Asia, and Eastern Europe. And the founding around 1280 of the Ottoman Empire. South Asia saw a series of Middle Kingdoms in India, followed by the establishment of Islamic empires in India. In Western Africa, the Mali Empire and Songhai Empire developed. On the southeast coast of Africa, Arabic ports were established where gold, spices, and other commodities were traded. This allowed Africa to join the Southeast Asia's trading system, bringing it contact with Asia. This, along with Muslim culture, resulted in the Swahili culture. All right. China experienced the success of Sui, Tang, Song, and Yuan, and early Ming dynasties. East, Middle Eastern trade routes along the Indian Ocean and the Silk Road through the Gobi Desert provide a limited economic and cultural contact between Asian and European civilizations. During the same period in the Americas, such as the Inca, Maya, and Aztecs, reached their zenith. All would be compromised, then conquered after contact with European colonists at the, at the beginning of the modern period. Okay, so that's that. I, I don't know if that was like an intro or an actual content. I'm an idiot, but I'm not stupid. Yes. Second round of shout out to Fiat. Greater Middle East. Prior to the advent of Islam in the 7th century, the Middle East was dominated by the Byzantine Empire and Persian Sassanian Empire, which frequently fought each other for control of several disputed regions. This was also a culture competing against the Persian Iranian traditions and Zoroastrian religion. I know I, I know I didn't get the right. The formation of the Islamic religion created a new contender that quickly surpassed both of these empires. Islam greatly affected the political, economic, and military history of the Old World, especially the Middle East. <sighs> From their center in on the Arabian Peninsula, Muslims began their expansion during the early post-classical era. By 750, they came to conquer most of their near east, North Africa, and parts of Europe, ushering in an era of learning, science, and invention known as the Islamic Golden Age. The knowledge and skills of the ancient Near East, Greece, and Persia were reserved in post-classical era by Muslims. Okay, I gotta stop. Who also added new and important in innovations from outside, such as the manufacture of paper from China and decimal positional numbering from India. Did you just second shout out for me? <laughs> yeah, I did. It was a random shout out though. This time, when I shout out Fia, it's a real shout out because, uh, just, just cause. Uh, but don't like, don't act like I'm more than just a teenager. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. 
Like, um, I mean, it's it's not that big of a deal that I shouted you out. There's only five people here. There, there will be more. There has been more, but I'm I'm, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just I'm just saying. Um. Okay, so much of this learning and development can be linked to geography. Even, even prior to Islam's presence, the city of Mecca had served as a center of trade in Arabia, and the Islamic prophet Muhammad himself was a merchant. With the new Islamic tradition of the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, the city became even more of a center uh, for exchanging goods and ideas. The influence held by Muslim merchants over African, Arabian, and Arabian Asian trade routes was tremendous. As a result, Islamic civilization grew and expanded on the basis of its merchant economy in contrast to the Europeans, Indians, and Chinese, who based their societies on an agriculture landholding nobility. Merchants oh, okay. Um, merchants brought goods and their Islamic faith to China, India, South Asia, and the kingdoms of Western Africa, and returned with new discoveries and inventions. Motivated by religion and the dreams of conquest, European leaders launched a number of crusades to try to roll back the Muslim power and retake the Holy Land. Okay, we're just kind of, we're kind of just like brushing over the crusades here. That's how you know it's a lot of information. Okay, the Crusades were ultimately unsuccessful and served more to weaken the Byzantine Empire, especially with the 1204 uh, sack of Constantinople. Constantinople. The Byzantine Empire began to lose increasing amounts of territory to the Ottoman Empire. That was not much. Um, Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Turks, actually. Um... Arab domination in the region ended in the mid-11th century with the arrival of Seljuk Turks migrating south from the Turkic, Turkic homelands in Central Asia. Sorry. Um, in the th early 13th century, a new wave of invaders, the Mongol Empire, swept through the region but were eventually eclipsed by the Turks and the founding of the Ottoman Empire in modern Turkey around 1280. North Africa saw the rise of polities formed by Berbers, such as the Marinid dynasty in Morocco, the Zainad dynasty in Algeria, and the Hafsid dynasty in Tunisia. The region will later be known, be called the Barbary Coast, and will host pirates and privateers who will use several North African ports for their raids against the coastal towns of several European countries in search of slaves to be sold in North African markets as part of the Barbary slave trade. So, um, dark turn there. But I mean, we, we knew that, but still, that's a pretty dark turn. Um, starting with the Sui dynasty, 581 to 618, the Chinese began expanding into Eastern Central Asia and confronted Tur Turkic nomads who were becoming the most dominant eth ethnic group in Central Asia. Originally, their relationship was largely cooperative, but in 1680, the Tang Dynasty the Tang Dynasty began an offensive against the Turks, capturing areas of the Mongolian Ordos Desert. In the 8th century, Islam began to penetrate the region and soon became the sole faith of most of the population, though Buddhism remained strong in the East. The desert nomads of Arabia would military, mi militarily match the nomads of the steppe, and the early Arab empire gained control over parts of Central Asia. The things were most powerful in the nomad groups in the 6th and 7th centuries and controlled much of the region. In the 9th through 13th centuries, the region was divided among several powerful states, including the Samanid Empire, the, Seju the, Shou the Seljuk Empire, and the... I don't even want to say that. Empire. The largest empire to rise out of Central Asia developed when Genghis Khan united the tribes of Mongolia. 
The Mongol Empire spread to compromise all of Central Asia and China, as well as large parts of Russia in the Middle East. After Genghis Khan died in 1227, most of Central Asia continued to be dominated by a successor state. Um, Chigatai Kane. Actually, that's not right. I forgot how to say his name. Um, in 1369, Timur, Timur, a Turkic leader in the Mongol military tradition, conquered, I'm going to stand up here, conquered, lost it again. He conquered most of the region and founded the Timurid Empire. Timur's large empire collapsed soon after his death, however. The region then became divided into a series of smaller khanates that were created by the Uzbeks. These include the Khanate of Kava, the Khanate of Bukhara, and the Khanate of Kokan. All of those capitals were located in present-day Uzbekistan. Swipe up. Um, these include the Khanate... Oh, wait. No. In the aftermath of the byzantine Sassanian Wars, the, Caucas, the Caucasus saw Armenia and Georgia flourish as independent realms free from foreign suzerainty? suzerainty? However, the Byzantine and Sassanian empires, exhausted from war, the Arabs were given the opportunity to proceed to the Caucasus during the early Muslim conquests. By the 13th century, the arrival of the Mongols saw the region invaded and subjugated once again. Hold on, we're in the next part. It's Europe in the post-classical era. Things about to go down. Things are about to go down. So, Europe in the post classical era. What's the biggest thing? I mean, is the. I don't even know. It's a good question. Which, which uh, era in Europe was more devastating? The Middle, the Middle Ages, like Crusades and everything, or the World War period. Let you decide that. Ah. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. No chair. You don't. Oh, I can see the pixels. I can I can also see my own foot fish. We're getting to the one hour point. Whew. Europe. Europe during the early Middle Ages was characterized by depopulation, deurbanization, and the barbarian invasion, all of which begun in the late and that's I guess, yeah, they got straight to the point. And antiquity. <sighs> the barbarian invaders formed their own new kingdoms in the remains of the Western Roman Empire. In the 7th century, North Africa and the Middle East, once part of the Eastern Roman Empire, became part of the Caliphate, Caliphate after the conquest by Muhammad's successors. Although there were substantial changes in society and political st structures, most of the new kingdoms incorporated as many of the existing Roman institutions as they could. Christianity expanded in Western Europe, and monasteries were founded. In the 7th and 8th centuries, the Franks, them Franks, under the Carolingian, Carolingian dynasty, established the empire covering much of Western Europe. It lasted until the 9th century, when succumbed to pressure by new invaders, the Vikings, Magyars, and Sacrens. During the High Middle Ages, when they all got high, began after 1000, the population of Europe increased greatly as technological and agricultural in innovations allowed trade to flourish and crop yields to increase. Mineralism, <laughs> manner, 
feudalism, the organization of peasants in the villages that owned rents and labor services and nobles, and feudalism, a political structure uh, whereby knights and lower status nobles owned military service to their overlords in, in return for the rights to rents, land, and manners. Were two of the ways that kingdoms became more centralized after the decentralizing effects of the breakup of the Carolingian Empire. Period. The Crusades, first preached in 1095, were an attempt by Western Christians from nations such as the Kingdom of England, the Kingdom of France, and the Holy Roman Empire to regain control of the Holy Land from the Muslims, and succeeded for long enough to establish some Christian states in the nearest, Near East. Italian merchants imported slaves to work in households or in sugar processing. Intellectual life was marked by scholaritism and the founding of universities, while the building of Gothic uh, cathedrals was one of the outstanding artistic achievements of the age. The late Middle Ages were marked by difficulties and calamities. Famine, plague, and war devastated the population of Western Europe. The Black Death alone killed approximately 75 to 200 million people between uh, 1347 and 1350. It was one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. Starting in Asia, the disease reached Mediterranean and Western Europe during the late 1340s and killed tens of millions of Europeans in six years. Between a third and half of the population perished. I don't know why I didn't expect, like, to read about anything bad, obviously. Even though, obviously, we would. That's not good. I need the sliding over here. Still no. Okay, whatever. Um... The Middle, Ages, the Middle Ages witnessed the first sustained urbanization of Northern and Western Europe, and it lasted until the beginning of the early modern period in the 16th century. Marked by the rise of nation-states, the division of Western Christianity in the Reformation, the rise of humanism in the Italian Renaissance, and the beginnings of European overseas expansion, which allowed for the Columbian Exchange. In Central and Eastern Europe, in 18, 1386, <clears throat> I just got a notification. Sport. Um, in the beginnings of the European overseas expansion, which allowed for the Columbian exchange. Glass of Milk says this is certainly very epic. Well, I agree it's pretty epic, but I prefer water. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, this has a AP Euro view. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm taking AP Euro next year. Um, everyone's saying, take a push, take a push. And they're crazy. They're delusional. AP Euro is where it's at. Um, I mean, also, I'm also taking AP Euro in uh, human history, so. I don't know, maybe this could be something, even though I like knew all of this. I don't know, like the exact names of everything, but well. In Eastern Europe, in 1386, the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, the latter including territories of modern Belarus and Ukraine, facing depredations by the Teutonic kings, knights, not kings, and later also threats from Muscovy, the Crimean Tatars, and the Ottoman Empire formed a personal union through the marriage of Poland's queen to Lithuanian Grand Duke, Mr. Guy thing, who became King Wibbla the II of Poland for the next four centuries until the 18th century. Oh, no, this, this is big. I shouldn't be messing around. This is the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. Until the 18th century, partitions the Poly Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth by Prussia, Russia, and Austria the two polities conducted a federated uh, condominium. Long Europe, Long Europe's largest state, which welcomed diverse 
ethnicity, ethnic, ethnicities, and religions, including most of the world's Jews, furthered furthered scientific thought. Example: Copernic, Copernicus's helios, heliocentric theory, and in a last a last ditch effort to preserve their sovereignty, adopted the Constitution of 1791, May 3rd. The world's second modern written constitution after the U.S. Constitution went into effect in 1789. Okay, that's Europe. That's that's Europe. That's that's Europe. Mm. Mm. I get the water. My my mouth is like becoming dry every minute. I should really drink water like after every sentence. But here we go. Sub-Saharan Africa. Medieval Sub-Saharan Africa was home to many different civilizations. I'm gonna keep back and read. Just be finishing this thing. Um, medieval Sub-Saharan Africa was home to many different civilizations. The kingdom of Aksum declined in the 7th century as Islam cut it off from its Christian allies, and its people moved further into, into the Ethiopian highlands for protection. Yeah. Um, they eventually gave way to the Zagwe dynasty, who are famed for their rock-cut architecture at Lalibla. Uh, Lalibla. Lalibla. It sounds like I'm just messing around, but that's actually what's called. Um, the Zagwe would then fall to the Sol Solomonic dynasty, who claimed descent from the Aksumite emperors, and would rule the country well into the 20th century. In the West African Sahel region, many Islamic empires rose, such as the Ghana Empire, the Maui Empire, the Songhai Empire, and the Kanim Bornu Empire. No, Bornu. They controlled the Trans Saharan trade in gold, ivory, salt, and slaves. South of, south of the Sahel, civilizations rose in the coastal forests where horses and camels could not survive. These include the Yoruba city of life, of Ifi, not life, Ifi, but for its art, and the Oyo Empire, the Kingdom of Benin, the Idu people centered in Benin City, the Igbo Kingdom of Nuri, which produced advanced bronze art at Igbo Uku, and the Akan, who are noted for their intricate architecture. Here we go, next. <sighs> Central Africa saw the birth of several states, including the Kingdom of Congo, in what is now modern Southern Africa. Uh, in what is now modern South Africa. Native, Amer uh, Native Africans created various kingdoms, such as the Kingdom of Mutba. They flourished through trade with the Swahili people on the African East Coast. They built large defensive stone structures without mortar, such as the Great Zimbabwe, capital of the Kingdom of Zimbabwe, Kami, the king Kami capital of the Kingdom of Bhutan, and Danagombe, the capital of the Razwe Empire. The the Swahili people themselves were inhabitants of East African coasts, from Kenya to Mozambique. They traded extensively with Asians and Arabs, who introduced them to Islam. They built many port cities such as Mabasa, Zanzibar, and Kilawa, which were known to Chinese sailors under Zheng He and Islamic geographers. That is Africa. Just guess we're just going by era and by region in that era. Let's 
Let's just go like this. Whew, South Asia. In northern India, after the fall of the Gupta Empire, the region was divided into a complex and fluid network of smaller kingly states. Early Islam incursions began in the west in 712, when the Arab uh, Umayyad Caliphate annexed much of present-day Pakistan. Um, Arab military was Arab military advance was largely hated at that point, but Islam still spread in India, largely due to the influence of Arab merchants along the western coast. The ninth century saw a Tripurite struggle for control of northern India among the Pratihara Empire, the Pal Empire, and the Rashtrakuta Empire. Some of the important states that emerged in India this time was the ba the Bahmani Sul Sultanate. Sultanate. And uh, no joke, Vayanagara Empire. Post classical dynasties in South India included those of the Chalukyas, the Hosalas, the Cholas, and the Islamic Mughals, Mughals the Marathas, and the Mizoras. Science, engineering, art, literature, astronomy, and philosophy flourished under the patronage of these kings. They are kings. We're over an hour in. And I think we're making good progress. I think. I think we are... I think we might be done. It's going to be less than three hours. So less than two hours from now, we'll be done. I don't think we'll be done by the two-hour part, two-hour mark. But I can't say. Maybe we are. Because after this, I'm pretty sure they're not going to go too much into, like, modern history. Like, after 1900. Like, they're just going to keep it real. With everything else. So. Oh. Northeast Asia. After a period of relative disunity, China was reunited by the Xiu Dynasty of 581 after the succeeding Tang Dynasty in China entered the Golden Age. Um, okay. The Tang Empire competed with the Tibetan, Tibetan Empire for control of eras in Inner and Central Asia. The Tang Dynasty eventually splintered. However, ap however, after half a century of turmoil in the Song Dynasty, reunited China. When it was, according to William McNeil, the richest, most skilled, and most populous country on Earth. Which is probably still true. And is most populated. Pressure from nomadic empires to the north became increasingly urgent. By 1142, North China had been lost to the Jurchens in the Jingsong Wars, and the Mongol Empire conquered all of China in 1279, along with almost half of Eurasia's landmass. Wow. After about a century of Mongol Yuan Dynasty rule, the ethnic Chinese reasserted control of the founding of the Ming Dynasty. Oh, it's the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> In Japan, the imperial lineage had been established by this time, and during the Asuka period, the Yamato province developed into a clearly centralized state. Buddhism was introduced, and there was emphasis on the adoption of elements in Chinese con culture as Confucianism. The Nara period of the 8th century marked the emergence of strong Japanese state, and is often portrayed as a golden age. During this period, the imperial government undertook great public works, including government offices, temples, roads, and irrigation systems. The Heian period, 17, 794 to 1185. saw the peak of imperial power, followed by the rise of mili militarized clans and the beginning of Japanese feudalism. 
The feudal period of Japanese history, dominated by power, powerful regional lords and military war, rule of warlords, shoguns, such as the Ashiga shogunate and the Tokujua shogunate, stretched from 1185 to 1868. The emperor remained, but mostly as a figurehead, and the power of merchants was weak. Post-classical Korea saw the end of the Three Kingdoms era, the kingdoms being those three. Silla conquered B in 1680 and G in 1668, marking the beginning of the North-South States period, with unified Silla in the South and B a successor state to G in the North. In 892, this arrangement reverted to the later three kingdoms, with G, then called Taebong, and eventually named Goryeo, merging as dominant, unifying the entire peninsula by 19, I mean 936. The founding Goryeo dynasty ruled until 1392, succeeded by the Joseon dynasty, which ruled for approximately 500 years. 500 years? Southeast, oh, we're in Southeast Asia? I thought we already... Now South Asia, we're in Southeast Asia now. The beginning of the Middle Ages in Southeast Asia saw the fall of the Kingdom of Furan to the Shenhua Empire, which was then replaced by the Kemen Empire. The Kemen people's capital city, Angkor, was the largest city of the world prior to the Industrial Age and contained thousands of temples, most being Angkor Wat. The Sungoi and Atuhada kingdoms were major powers in the Thai people who influenced the Kumar. Starting in the 6th and 9th century, the Pagan Kingdom rose to prominence in modern Myanmar. It collapsed. Its collapse brought the political fragmentation to end the rise of the Tungo Empire in the 16th century. That's as fast as I could do it. And I gotta drink. I gotta drink. Almost out. I'm gonna get water again. I'm just chill up, laying back. The Sugutai, the Sugutai and the Ahutia kingdoms were major powers of the Thai people who were influenced by the Kuru. Starting in the 9th century, the pagan kingdom rose in prominence proud of Myanmar. I already, wrote, I already read those. Great. Okay, so I've, I've read more than an entire wiki page now. Once I'm done. Other notable kingdoms in the period include the Severgian Empire and the Lava Kingdom, both coming in the province in the 7th century. The Champa and the Haripanchai, both about 1750. Um, Div Diviet, the Longna, the Majapai. Oh my god. I, I know this. Majapahit, 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 from Bill Words. Um, Langzhang. And the kingdom, of, the kingdom of Ava. I gotta show my sister that. This period saw the spread of Islam to the present-day Indonesia, beginning in the 13th century, and the emergence of the Malay states, including Malacca Sultanate and the Bruneian Empire. In the Philippines, several polities arose during this period, including the Regate of Malania, Regate of Cebu, and Cebu, and the Regate of Bhutan. Oceania. I'm going to drink again because it's another section and I just need it. This is much more tiring than the other challenges that I've done. Oceania. In the region of Oceania, the Tutong Empire. Tonga Empire was founded in the 10th century and expanded between 1200 and 1500. The Tongan culture, language, and homogamy spread widely throughout eastern Melanesia, Micronesia, and central Polynesia during this pyramid period, influencing East Ueva, Rutoma, Futana, Samoa, and Muir, as well as specific islands and part of Micronesia, Kiribati, Palm, Pompeii, 
and miscellaneous others. Vanuccio and New Caledonia, specifically the Loyalty Islands, with the main island being prominently populated by Melanesian Kanak people and their cultures. At the same time, a powerful, a powerful thalassocracy appeared in eastern Polynesia, centered around the Society Islands. How have I never heard of the Society Islands? I mean, I live there. I live in this. We live in the Society Islands. Uh, specifically on the sacred Marais, which drew in Eastern Polynesian colonists from places far away as Hawaii, New Zealand, and the Tuamato Islands for political, spiritual, and economic reasons until the unexplained collapse of regular long-distance voyaging in the Eastern Pacific a few centuries before Europeans began exploring the area. Indigenous written records from this period are virtually non-existent as it seems that all Pacific Islanders, okay, I think we're, we're definitely more than halfway right through, as I can look through this uh, scrolling page here. Except the possible exception of the Numenic, Rupai, and currently undecipherable Wangaranago script had no writing systems of any kind until their introduction by European colonists. However, some indigenous prehistories can be estimated and academically reconstructed through careful, judicious analysis of native oral traditions. Colonial ethnography, archaeology, physical anthropology, and linguistics research. The Americas. In North America, <coughs> In North America, this period saw the rise of Mississippian culture in the modern-day United States. In 800, marked by the extensive 12th-century urban complex at Ch uh, Cahokia, the ancestral, ancestral Pueblos, Pueblos and their predecessors, 19th to 13th centuries, built extensive permanent settlements, including stone structures that would remain the largest buildings in North America until the 19th century. It's actually pretty crazy. In Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica, uh, this so this Teotihuacan so civilization fell to the classic Maya collapse occurred. The Aztec Empire came to dominate much of Mesoamerica in the 14th, 15th centuries. In South America, <coughs> in South America, the 14th and 15th centuries saw the rise of the Inca. The Inca Empire in Tuancio, with its capital in Cusco, spanned the entire Andes, making it the most extensive pre-Columbian civilization. The Inca were prosperous and advanced, known for the excellent road system and unrivaled masonry. Okay, so now we about to hit modern history. Which means we're actually almost done. We're actually almost done. I'm just gonna need to get another water. Oh, what do you need? Oh. Oh. Getting into the modern history. This is gonna be. Let's go. Modern history. Okay, so this is gonna be. This is up to. This, I mean, it should be up to 2020. Like 12th century to. 21st century should be. Maybe even, maybe not the latest uh, 15th century to 21st century. I mean, uh, 16th century. 
16th century to 21st century, the, most, uh, the modern period. And we are doing this. Okay. All right. Modern history. In the linear global histographical approach, modern history, or the modern period, the modern era, and the modern times, is the history of the period following post-classical history in Europe known as the Middle Ages. So after the Middle Ages is modern history. Spawning, spanning from about 1500 to the present. So yeah, I was right. It's it's um 16th century to 21st century. That's about 500 years. We're only, we're only 500 years off from now. Which means we're almost done. <laughs> Spanning contemporary history includes uh, events from around 1945 to the present, so it's not contemporary history. Definition of both terms, modern history and contemporary history, have changed over time as more history has occurred, so so have their start dates. Contemporary history is probably like the last 50 years, so when that term was invented, it was like 1850 to 1900, but now it's 1945 to Modern history can be broken down into these periods. Oh, so I, it's okay, so I don't need to read that. All right. Oh, we still have to go with the Renaissance. God. Okay, the early modern period. The early modern, the early modern period. It actually hasn't taken as long as I thought. We got so many more viewers on, on the original stream. It's kind of unfortunate. The early modern period. These are actually pretty quick. Was a period between Middle Ages and the Industrial Revolution, roughly 1500 to 1800. The early modern period was characterized by the rise of science and increasingly rapid technological pro progress Secularized civics, politics, and the nation state. Uh, capitalist economies began their rise initially in northern Italian republics, such as Genoa. Period. The early and modern period saw the rise and dominance of merchantist eco economic theory and the decline and eventual disappearance of much of the years in much of the European sphere of feudalism, serfdom, and the rise of power of the class of the Catholic Church. The period included Protestant Reformation, the disastrous Thirty Years' War, the Age of Exploration, um, European colonial expansion, the peak of European witch hunting, the Scientific Revolution, and the Age of Enlightenment. Okay, that's all of the early modern period. Here we have the Renaissance. Europe's Renaissance, the rebirth of classical culture, began in the 14th century and extending into the 16th, compromised by the rediscovery of the classical world's cultural, scientific, and technological achievements and the economic, economic and social rise of Europe. The Renaissance endured a culture of, uh, which led to the humanism and the scientific revolution. This period, which saw, which, <laughs> which saw social and political upheavals and revolutions in many intellectual pursuits is also celebrated for its artistic developments and the attainments of polymaths as Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, Michelangelo who, dis who inspired the term Renaissance man. It's true. Who's the true Renaissance man? Is it da Vinci or Michelangelo? Okay. I'm going to stop for a European expansion because it's quite a large section. European. Leave a like for European expansion. Okay, 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 we're almost done. We're actually almost done with this. European expansion. 
During this period, European powers came to dominate most of the world. Although most, uh, although most were developed regions of European classical civilization, civilization were more urbanized than any other re region of the world, European civilization had undergone a lengthy period of gradual decline and collapse. During the early modern period, Europe was able to regain its dominance. Historians still debate the causes. Europe's success in this period stands in contrast to other regions. For example, one of the most advanced civilizations in the Middle Ages was China. It had developed an advanced monetary economy by 1000. China had a three peasantry who were no longer subsistent farm farmers and could sell the products, <laughs> produce actively participate in the market. Oh, we're down to one viewer, I don't know. Um, China had been long one of the richest, most fertile, best cultivated, most industrious, most urbanized, and most prosperous countries in the world. It enjoyed a technological advantage and had a monopoly in cast iron production, piston bellows, suspension bridge construction, printing, and the compass. However, it seemed to have it seemed to have long since stopped progressing. Marco Polo, who visited China in the 13th century, describes its cultivation, industry, and populousness almost at the same terms as travelers would in the 18th century. Just checking that lighting again. Don't look straight at the light. It's not a good idea. Yeah, sure. Okay. Light, light quality is going down. Um, all right. So, one theory of Europe's rise holds that in Europe's geography played an important role in its success. The Middle East, India, and China are all ringed by mountains and oceans, but once past these outer barriers, they're nearly flat. By contrast, the Pyrenees, the Alps, Apennines, Carpathians, and other mountain ranges run through Europe, and the Europe and the continent is also divided by several seas. This gave Europe some degree of protection from the peril of Central Asian invaders. Before the era of firearms, <coughs> for the era of firearms, these nomads were militarily superior than the agricultural states of periphery and the European continent, and they broke out in the plains of northern India or the valleys of China, but all were unstoppable. The, these invasions were often were devastating. The Golden Age of... Spit my lip. Like, well, biting your lip is such a motivation stopper. Like, like that. Let's go read some more. <laughs> Let's go read some more. Um, all in subtle. These invasions were often devastating. The Golden Age of Islam was ended by the Mongol sack of Baghdad in 1258. India and China were subject to periodic invasions, and Russia spent a couple of centuries under the Mongol Tatyr yoke. Central and Western Europe, logistically, more distant from Central Asian heartland, proved less vulnerable than these threats. Geography contributed to important geopolitical differences. For most of their histories, China, India, and the Middle East were unified under a single dominant power that, extent, that expanded it until reaching the surrounding mountains and deserts. In 1600, the Ottoman Empire controlled almost all of the Middle East. The Ming Dynasty ruled over China, and the Mughal Empire held sway over India. By contrast, Europe was almost always divided in a number of warring states. Pan-European empires, with the notable exception of the Roman Empire, tended to collapse soon after, they, soon after they rose. Another doubtless important geographic factor was the rise of Europe in the Mediterranean Sea, which for millennia had functioned as a maritime superhighway, fostering for exchange of goods, people, people, 
Oh, yeah, slaves. Ideas and inventions. <clears throat> you could hear. I think I am. All right. Anyway, all of the agricultural civilizations have been heavily constrained by their environments. Productive productivity remained low, and climate changes, climatic changes, easily instigated boom and bust cycles that brought about civilizations rise and fall. By about 1500, however, there was just a qualitative change in world history. Technological advance had, and the wealth generated by trade gradually brought about a widening of possibilities. See here, self promotion. I don't know what that means. Um, many have argued. You also argued that Europe's institutions allowed it to expand that property rights and free market economics were still were, no, were stronger than elsewhere due to an ideal of freedom peculiar to Europe. In recent years, however, <clears throat> scholars such as Kenneth Pomerantz, Pomerantz, um, Kenneth Pomerantz have challenged this view. Europe's maritime expansion, unsurprisingly, given the continent's geography, was largely at work to its Atlantic states, Portugal, Spain, England, France, and the Netherlands. Initially, the Portuguese and Spanish empires were the predominant conquerors and sources of influence, and the union resulted in the Iberian Union, the first global empire on which the sun never set. Soon there were more northern English, French, and Dutch began dominating the Atlantic. In a series of wars thought in the 18th, 17th and 18th centuries, culminating with the Napoleonic Wars, Britain emerged as a new world power. <clears throat> okay, we're going into regional development. That was European expansion. It's all done. Took good 15 minutes. All right. Let's go. Regional development. Persia became the came under new rule of the Safavid Empire in 1501, succeeded by the Afsarid Empire in 1736, the Zan Empire in 1751, and the Qajar Empire in 1794. Areas to the north and east in Central Asia were helped by the Uzbeks and Pashtuns. The, the Ottoman Empire, after taking Constantinople in 1453, quickly gained control of the Middle East, the Balkans, and most of North Africa. <clears throat> that's a weird. That's a weird. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In Africa, this period saw a decline in many civilizations and advancements in others. The Swahili coast declined after coming under the Portuguese Empire and later the Omani Empire. In West Africa, the Shanghai Empire fell to the Moroccans in 1591 when they were invaded with guns. That's just a weird warning. Um, the South African Kingdom of Zimbabwe gave way to smaller kingdoms such as the Mutapa, Mutapa, uh, Buta, and was in Rosvi. Ethiopia suffered from the uh, 1531 invasion from neighboring Muslim Adult Sultanate, and in 1769 entered the Zemanine Misfit Age of Princes, during which the emperor became a figurehead, and the country was ruled by warlords. Though a royal line later would recover under Emperor Terodos II. The Ajaran Sultanate in the Horn of Africa began to decline in the 17th century, succeeded by the Gelati Sultanate. Other civilizations in Africa advanced during this period. The Oyo Empire experienced its golden age, as did the Kingdom of Benin. The Ashensi Empire rose into power in what is modern day Ghana in 1670. The Kingdom of the Congo also thrived during this period, European exploration of Africa reached Zenith during this time. In China, the Ming gave way in 1644 to the Qing, the last Chinese imperial dynasty, which would rule until 1912. Japan experienced its Ajuki Bumayama period, followed by the Edo period, followed by the Korean Joseon dynasty. I don't know. The, <clears throat> the Korean Joseon dynasty ruled throughout this period. Successfully repealing 16th and 17th century invasions from Japan and China. Japan and China were significantly affected during this period by expanded, expanded maritime trade of Europe, particularly the Portuguese and Japan. 
During the Edo period, Japan would pursue isolationist policies to eliminate foreign influences. On the Indian subcontinent, the Delhi Sultanate and the Deccan Sultanates would give way, beginning in the 16th century, to the Mughal Empire. Starting in the Northwest, the Mughal Empire would be a late 17th century to come, come to rule the entire subcontinent, except for the southernmost Indian provinces, which would remain independent. <clears throat> Against the Muslim Mughal Empire, the Hindu Martha Empire was founded on the West Coast in 1670, 1674. 1674. <laughs> that was just an audio check. Um, 1674, gradually gaining territory, a majority of present-day India, from the Mughals over several decades, particularly in the Mughal Maratha Wars, 1681 to 1701. Several decades, you know, the Maratha Empire would fall, would in, would in, this is, it's bad wording, the Maratha Empire would, in 1818, fall under the control of the British East India Company with all former Maratha and Mughal authority devolving in 1858 to the British Raj. <clears throat> in 1511, the Portuguese overthrew the Malacca Sultanate in present-day Malaysia and in Indonesia, Sumatra. <clears throat> the Portuguese held this important trading territory and the valuable associated navigational strait until overthrown by the Dutch in 1641. The Johar Sultanate, centered on the southern tip of Malay Peninsula, became the dominant trading power in the region. European colonization expanded the Dutch in the Netherlands, East Indies, the Portuguese in East Timor, and the Spanish in the Philippines. Into the 19th century, European expansion would affect the, all, the whole of Southeast Asia, with the British in Myanmar, in Malaysia, and the French, and in the China. <coughs> no, I'm not, I need a drink. Everything in this world is trying to stop me from finishing this wiki page, but it's not going to happen. The Pacific Islands, <laughs> we just got right back into it. The Pacific Islands of Oceania would be affected by European contract, starting with a circumnavigation of voyage of Ferdinand Magellan. Hmm, Ferdinand Magellan. Magellan. I haven't heard of him in a long time. Who landed on the Marinas? Marinas, and other islands in 1521. Also notable were the voyages of Abel Tasman to present-day Australia, New Zealand, and nearby islands, and the voyages of Captain James Cook. Good old James Cook, who made the first ever recorded European contact with Hawaii. Just put your feet up. Britain will also found its first colony in Australia in 1788. In the Americas, the Western European powers vigorously colonized new discovered continents, um, largely, displa largely displacing uh, the indigenous populations and destroying the advanced civilization of the Aztecs and the Incas. Spain, Portugal, Britain, and France all made extensive territorial claims and undertook large-scale settlement, including the importation of large numbers of African slaves. <clears throat> this I, I'm talking so much like uh, out loud that it's just messing with my throat like insane Portugal claimed Brazil Portugal claimed Brazil Spain claimed the rest of South America Mesoamerica and Southern North America oh this man that's kind of a lot you, you can show um, Britain colonized the east coast of North America and France colonized the central region of North America Russia made incursions to the northwest coast of North America, 
the first colony in present-day Alaska in 1784, and the outpost of Fort Ross in present-day California in 1812. Oh, I didn't know they went that far down. Um, in 1862, in the midst of the Seven Years' War, France secretly ceded most of its North American claim to Spain <clears throat> in the Treaty of uh, Fontainebleau. Thirteen of the British... <laughs> here, we go. here we go. It's time. It's time. When the real history begins. Um, 13 of the British colonies declared independence as the United States of America in 1776, ratified by the Treaty of Paris in 1783, ending the American Revolutionary War. Napoleon Bonaparte Napoleon Bonaparte won France's claims back from Spain in the Napoleonic Wars, but in 1880, in 1800, but sold them to the United States in 1803 as the Louisiana Purchase. In Russia, Ivan the Terrible was crowned in 1540. Okay, we're going back. We're just going way back. In 1547, as the first Tsar of Russia, and by annexing the Turkish. <clears throat> Why else does I die? Mm. I'm not gonna do it yet. In Turkish Canaanites in the East transformed Russia into a regional power. The countries of Western Europe, while expanding prodigiously through technological advancement and colonial conquest, competed with each other economically and militarily in a state of almost constant war. Often the wars had a religious dimension, either Catholic versus Protestant, or primarily Eastern Christian versus Muslim. Wars of particular note include the Thirty Years' War, the War of Spanish Succession, Seven Years' War, and the French Revolutionary Wars. Napoleon came back to came to power in France in 1799, uh, an event foreshadowing Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century. <clears throat> okay, 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 okay. All right, I can see, I can almost see the end of this wiki page. We are in the late modern period, 1750 to 1914. Scientific revolution to World War One, And after that, it's pretty much done. They haven't written much since. The scientific revolution changed humanity's understanding of the world and led to the Industrial Revolution, a major transformation of the world's economies. The scientific revolution in the 17th century had little immediate effect on industrial technology. Only in the second half of the 18th century did scientific advancements advances in, uh, begin to be applied substantially to practical invasion. The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain and used new models of production, the factory, the factory mass production and mechanization to manufacture a wide array of goods faster and using less labor than previously required. The Age of Enlightenment also led to the beginnings of modern democracy. In the late 18th century, American and French revolutions, period, um, democracy and republicanism would also grow to profound effect on world, on world offense, events and the quality of life. Um, after Europeans had achieved, <clears throat> after Europeans had achieved influence over the Americas, imperial, imperial activities turned to the lands of Asia and Oceania. That's, that's a great way to say it. Um, in the 19th century, the European states had social and technological advance advantage over eastern lands. Britain gained control of the Indian subcontinent, Egypt and the Malay Peninsula. The French took Indochina, while the Dutch cemented their control over the Dutch East Indies. The British also colonized Australia, New Zealand, and South, A South Africa, with large numbers of British colonists emigrating to these colonies. Whew. Russia colonized 
Oh my god, I can see it. Russia colonized pre-agricultural areas of Siberia. In the late 19th century, in the late 19th century, the European powers divided the remaining areas of Africa. Within Europe, economic and military challenges created a system of nation states, and ethno-linguistic groupings began to identify themselves as distinctive nations with aspirations for cultural and political autonomy. This nationalism would become important to the peoples across the world in the 20th century. During the Second Industrial Revolution, the world economy became reliant on coal as a fuel, as new, meshes, new methods of transport, such as railways and steamships, effectively shrank the world. Meanwhile, industrial pollution and environmental damage present since the discovery of fire and the beginning of civilization, accelerated drastically. The advantages, of, the advantages that Europe had developed by a mid-18th century were two. Okay. Two advantages of... Wait, what, what, are we, what are we getting to? I don't understand what they're trying to say here. Um... What? The world. There were two advantages that Europe had um, that developed in the mid 18th century. An entropunial culture and the wealth generated by the Atlantic trade, including the African slave trade. Hmm. Profits. By the late 16th century, Silver from the Americas accounted for the Spanish Empire's wealth. They just it. The profits of the slave trade in West Indian plantations accounted amounted to 5% of the British economy at the time of the Industrial Revolution. While some historians conclude that in 1750, labor productivity and in the most developed regions of China was still on par with that of Europe's Atlantic economy, other historians such as Angus Madison, hold that the per capita productivity of Western Europe had by the late Middle Ages surpassed that of all other regions. All right, so that's that part. Okay, we're in the 1914 to 1945. This is pretty much the end. Yeah, I can I can scroll down in one second to the end. Twentieth mm, mm, century. Okay, interwar period, worry twenties, Great Depression, twentieth century. I guess they don't mention that. The twentieth century opened with Europe at an apex of wealth and power, and with much of the world under its direct colonial control or its indirect domination. Much of the rest of the world was influenced by heavily Europe, 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 Europeanized nations, the United States and Japan. As the century unfolded, however, oh, I got you. As the century unfolded, however, the global system domination by rival powers was subjugated to severe strains, and ultimately yielded to a more fluid structure of independent nations organized on Western models. This transformation was catalyzed by wars and unparalleled scope and devastation. World War I led to the collapse of four empires, Austria-Hungary, German Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Russian Empire, and weakened Great Britain and France. In the war's aftermath, powerful ideologies rose to prominence. Russian Revolution in 1917 created the first communist state, while the while the 1920s and 30s saw militaristic fascist dictatorships gain control in Italy, Italy, Spain, and Germany, if you didn't know, and elsewhere. Ongoing national rivalries, um, exacerbated by the economic economic turmoil of the Great Depression. Well, now I I have to go to that.
break over. Okay, we're finishing this thing. We're finishing it. We're almost. I almost finished this part, and we're almost in contemporary history. Oh, I didn't even see the the comment that said you're not reading the references right i if i did this would take uh 10 times long so no okay here we go ongoing national rivalries exaggerated by the economic turmoil of the great depression helped participate precipitate world war ii the militaristic dictatorships of europe and japan pursued an ultimately doomed course of imperialist expansionism. And of course, I can't say that. Germany in orchestrated in the murder of... Mm, 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 can't say that. Millions of Poles, Russian, and other Slavs. While Imperial Japan murdered millions of Chinese. Earlier model of... Mm, can't say that. Have been provided by Turkey's World War I mass murder of the Armenians. Even though I guess I could technically say that because YouTube is bad. World War II, defeat of the, mm, can't say that, powers, opened the way for the advance of communism into Central Europe, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, Albania, China, North Vietnam, and North Korea. All right. Who? Kaha. Who ha Who? Who hi ha Who? It's time for contemporary history. Yeah, it's time for contemporary history. We got like five paragraphs to go, and we're just under the two-minute mark. We're just going to be over it. When World War II ended in 1945, the United Nations was founded in the hope of preventing future wars. As the League of Nations, yeah, this is going to be a slow one. As the League of Nations had formed during World War I, the war had left two countries, the United States and the Soviet Union, with principal power to influence international affairs. Each was suspicious of the other and feared a global spread of the others. Almost done. Um, and now I cannot remember. Um, each was suspicious of the other and feared a global spread of the others, respectively capitalist and communist, political economic model. <clears throat> This led to the Cold War, a 45-year standoff and arms race between the United States and its allies on one hand, and the Soviet Union and its allies on the other. With the development of nuclear weapons during World War II and their subsequent proliferation, all of humanity were put at risk of nuclear war between the two superpowers, as demonstrated by many incidents, most prominently the October 1962 October 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, such war being viewed as impractically the superpowers instead waged proxy wars in non and non nuclear armed third world countries. Good old proxy wars. In China, Mao Zedong, not Mao, no, not Mao. I hate Mao. I hate Mao. I got nothing against Mao, but I hate him. Implemented industrialization and collectivization reforms as part of the Great Leap Forward, leading to the starvation of deaths of tens of millions of people. Between 1969 and 1972, as part of the Cold War space race, <clears throat> our water... Oh, we're about to hit two hours. We didn't finish in two hours. Five, four, three, two... One, and we're over two hours. Between 1969 and 1972, as part of the Cold War space race, 12 men landed on the moon and safely returned to Earth. The Cold War ended in 1990... 1991. Something weird just happened. Um, when the Soviet Union dis disintegrated... Disintegrated? I don't think it disintegrated. I think it just collapsed. It, it like didn't turn into ash. Okay. 
in part due to inability to compete economically, compete economically with the United States and Western Europe. However, the United States likewise began to show signs of slippage in its geo geopolitical influence, even as its private sector, now less inhibited to, by the claims of the public sector, increasingly sought private advantage to the to the prejudice of the public wheel. In the early post-war decades, the colonies of Asia and Africa, of the Belgian, British, Dutch, French, and other European empires, won their formal independence. However, these newly independent countries often faced challenges in, porn, in the form of neo neocolonialism, sociopolitical socio disarray, poverty, literacy, and the endemic tropical diseases. Oh, I can see the end. We're just over a page. Oh, just over a page. I can see the 21st century. I can see 9-11. <laughs> Most Western European and Central European countries gradually... I feel like my throat is about to explode. I need more water. Um. God. Oh. The European Union's effectiveness was handicapped by the immaturity of its common economic and political institutions, somewhat comparable to the in... in of the United States institutions under the Articles of Confederation prior to the adoption of the U.S. Constitution that came into force in 1789. Asian, African, and South American countries followed suit and began taking tentative steps towards forming their own respective continental associations. <sighs> Cold War preparations to deter or, or fight a third Cold War to fight, accelerated advances in technology that, though conceptualized before World War II, had just been in, implemented for that war's ex exigencies? I don't know what that means. Um, such as jet aircraft, rocketry, and electronic computers. In the decades after World War II, these advances led to jet travel, artificial satellites, with innumerable applications, including global GPS, and the internet. Inventions that revolutionized the movement of people, ideas, and information. However, not all scientific and technological... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No. Um, okay. Um, this period... However, not all scientific and technological advances in the second half of the 21st century required initial military impetus. Impetus. That period also saw groundbreaking developments such as discovery of the structure of DNA, the consequent sequencing of the human genome, the worldwide eradication of smallpox, and the discovery of plate tectonics, man and unmanned exploration of space in previously in inaccessible parts of Earth, and foundation discoveries in physics, phenomena ranging from the smallest entities, particle physics, Everything's trying to stop me from finishing this uh, article, ain't it? Hold on a few. Okay. Okay. Inspiration, uh, physics. Okay, we're in the 21st century. This is, this is the end. This is the end. This is absolute, this is, we have less than a page left. And I, once we do, can do this. This is 
very special. It's a very special moment in my life. It's actually really not. They can't stop me from achieving my dreams of reading an entire wiki page in one setting. They can't do it. They can't do it. 21st century. It's ready. It's ready. 21st century. Twenty first century. The twenty first century has been marked by growing economic globalization and integration, with consequent increased risk to interlinked econ uh, economies, as exemplified by the Great Recession of the late two thousands and early twenty tens. This period has also been also seen as the expansion of communication with mobile phones and the internet, which have caused fundamental societies changes in business. Politics and individuals' personal lives. And I just realized, uh, did, did, did you hear that? No, I didn't. Uh, worldwide competition for resources has risen due to growing populations and industrialization, especially in China, India, and Brazil. And just wait to 2077. The increased demands are contributing to increased environmental degradation and global warming. The early 21st century, oh, I can see the end. The early 21st century saw the escalating intra and international strife in the Near East and Afghanistan, stimulated, stimulated by the vast economic disparities, by dissatisfaction with governments dominated by Western interests, um, by inter -ethnic, ethnic and intersection feuds, and by the longest war in the history of the United States. I didn't know, I didn't know that. Longest one in the history of the United States, the proximate cause for which Osama bin Laden's pr provocative 2001 destruction of New York City's World Trade Center, the Arab Spring, a revolutionary war of uh, uprisings in North, North Africa and the Near East in the early 2010s, produced power vacuums that led to a resurgence in um, authoritarianism and the advent of reactionary groups like Islamic states. U.S. and military involvement in the Near East... In and Afghanistan, along with the financial crisis and resultant recession, have drained U.S. economic resources at a time when the U.S. and other countries are experiencing mounting socioeconomic dislocations, ag aggravated by the robot robotization of work and the export of industries to cheaper workforce countries. Meanwhile, ancient and populous Asian civilizations India, and especially China, have been emerging from centuries of relative scientific, technological, and economic, economic dormancy to become potential economic and political rivals to, um, to Western powers. Last sentence. International tensions were heightened in connection for the efforts of some nuclear armed states to induce North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons and to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons and we're done that's it that's it then you got the you got the references i'm not reading the references and i'm not reading the explanatory notes and i'm not reading the c also all right yay 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 yay, yay. We're, we're done i this this whole thing do you know about Homo sapiens? I do now. I know all about it. Um, okay. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I finally finished. Um, I actually thought it was going to be a lot longer. Maybe if I uh, read everything, it would have been a lot longer. I thought it was going to be like five, six hours. This is my longest stream of doing something really dumb. I've gone four hours of saying tree 20,000 times. Yeah, I'm glad I'm, I didn't do that again. Thank you, everybody, for watching.